All right. So first to go will be Nick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Professor Nick Barter. I'm an academic in Griffith University in Brisbane, and I teach on uh, our MBA, which is number one in the world for being best for planet. And as well as that, I um, push forward a concept called Future Normal, which is about enabling organizations to be fit for the 21st century. Thank you. I will pass on to my next colleague. Great. So that was uh, Nick. Were you, were Nick, were you going to show something? Or um, Anyways, uh, hi. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Edwin Chan, and I am an architect. We're based in Los Angeles. Um, for uh, a long time, um, I worked for another architect by the name of Frank Gehry, and we worked on a lot of cultural buildings. So maybe the next slide. Um, the next slide. Yeah, so actually, the I, I probably put in too many images, but I figure, you know, it's better to have more and we can cut it than, than not. So one of the first project that we, we worked on, it's the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. And the way that I thought it's relevant here is that people have talked a lot about the architecture of this building, but most people didn't realize that this project has been a catalyst in terms of the cleaning up of the river. And it actually has uh, a major uh, role in the regeneration of the ecology of the city. So I think that might be a relevant thing. The next image uh, is a museum that I, I worked on, on in Paris. It's called the Foundation uh, Louis Vuitton. And I think what makes this project relevant to maybe our conversation later is that usually museums are very enclosed entity because they're kind of like a, a, a box that you have to put the art in. So it's like a, a, a vault. But what we try to do here is to make a museum that is much more integrated with the natural environment and is much more open to the surrounding park. Uh, it's called the, the, the Bois de Boulogne for those of you who's been there. And the third image is the next one is the first project that I worked on after I founded my own practice. It's called EC3. And it's a project that is located in the city of Detroit. And for those of you who know the city, um, understand that the city has been going through this sort of regeneration. So this project takes the ecology of the city uh, as a kind of urban jungle into consideration, and it is designed around the idea of the ecology of the city. Um, the next project. This one is a very small interior. It's called the Chalet. And I think what is interesting about this project is that we repurpose a white oak forest in uh, Pennsylvania to create this kind of environment, which has been then inserted into the National Sculpture Center in Dallas. And it's been incredibly successful. So you could actually, I think I'm very interested in this idea of repurposing nature and using it to create new architecture. The next image, this is um, for Gilbert, it's uh, the project that I worked with uh, UAP on. It's a dog sculpture. I just thought I'd throw this one in for fun. And then um, finally, I think uh, it's a, a net zero tower that we proposed uh, in the city of Sydney and trying to use mass timber construction to lower the carbon footprint, but also making a skyscraper that is 50% naturally ventilated. And hopefully if we could succeed, it would change the way we think about our workplace and, and also the urban landscape. So that's all I had to share so far. Great. Great. So I think I'm next. So I'm Gilbert Guaring. I'm the Global Head of Marketing, Sustainability and Engagement at UAP, Urban Art Projects. I want to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians of the land and water of where we are all meeting today. Um, and to all First Nations people and elders past, present, and emerging, I'm actually based in New York, but I'm now in Winnipeg, where the original lands and water are of Anishinaabem, Ininiwak, Anishinaabem, Dakota, and Dean peoples. 
I think the First Nations people are the first creatives, artists, and makers in our the constituents of our land. Like at UAP, where I work, they believe that incredible things don't just happen. They're created, nurtured, and believed in. And arts, culture, and creativity have always played a vital role in bringing people together. Um, if the next slide. So what you can see here is basically um, we're makers at heart. From the design studio to the fa factory floor, we work across all aspects of the creative process, from commissioning and curatorial services, concept development and design assistance, to engineering, fabrication, installation. You'll see here that we kind of like pair exceptional strategies and manufacturing. It's a fusion of the traditional manufacturing and also advanced manufacturing. Um, next slide, please. Our aim is to really uh, dedicate ourselves to the creative vision of artists. Um, we want to ensure that our generation creates timeless and relevant objects, ideas, and places that will inspire and connect people for generations to come. Um, as a company, we think that this is the common ground on which we move forward. So we, I look forward to having this discussion with everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm up next. Um, my name is Jenny Kendler. I'm an artist and an environmental activist. Um, currently, I am the artist in residence with the Natural Resources Defense Council, which you may be familiar with as NRDC, which is a international not-for-profit that works around um, environmental issues and tends to um, mostly sue governments and corporations to make sure that they're holding the line. Um, and I've been their first artist in residence since 2014. Um, I do some work with 350.org, who you're probably familiar with from this space on working against climate change. Um, and I'm also uh, have been spending a lot of time lately as a founding organizer for a new organization called Artists Commit, which is a artist run art, arts worker and artist run organization that is um, trying to essentially decarbonize the art world one exhibition at a time. So we've done projects recently with Tate Modern and um, with MOCA, with Hauser and Worth to get them to first uh, to use our tool, which is called the Climate Impact Report, to first track how much emissions um, arts exhibitions are putting out mm -hmm. and track waste stream and also like labor and equity issues. And then think about how that becomes like a normative part of what we do in the arts world and how we can then start to reduce those. Um, next slide, please. I'll just talk really briefly about some of my work. This is a project that was at the Storm King Art Center in New York, which is um, you're looking at a 40 foot sculpture that's reflective of 100 eyes of birds that are all threatened or endangered by climate change. Next slide. And this is a project that's currently at the Smithsonian Museum of um, National Museum of Natural History, um, where it's been for the last two years and maybe for another two days, actually. Um, and it is a player piano with an ivory keyboard that translates uh, an algorithmic score on um, elephant poaching deaths into music on a keyboard that is, that is essentially the material that's driving the poaching crisis. So it helps us to try to imagine what it would feel like to learn that elephants um, were extinct. And next slide, if there is one. And if there's not. Oh, and then this is a, this is from a recent solo show at the MSU Broad Museum. And what you're looking at on that central table is a collection of artists made amber, which is atten um, an attempt to try to preserve biological material from um, hundreds and potentially thousands of species that are threatened by the biodiversity crisis and climate change, um, preserving their DNA in this very analog and simple way for future generations, some um, future state where potentially it would be both ethical and feasible to de-extinct these creatures. But moreover, it's really a memorial for us in the middle of the sixth extinction to think about what we stand to lose. So I'm looking forward to our conversation too. Cool, okay. Um, I will go next. My name is Karen Lamont. I'm joining our division from the Czech Republic where I've been living and working for the past 25 years. I'm best known for my um, cast life-size cast glass dresses with impressions of absent female bodies on the inside. Also some kimonos cast in iron, ceramic, bronze, and glass as well. Um, in the broadest terms, I was thinking about how to describe what interests me, and I think it's people. I'm inspired by people and the cultures we create. I'm interested in exploring how we are creators of as individuals and then participants in culture and environment. 
Seven years ago, I began a new body of work with um, climatologists, and I wanted to create a scientifically accurate cloud sculpture. Um, so, you know, I've always been environmentally conscious, but the work I did with the climatologist was a huge awakening for me. And what I learned was that there is a cloud type stratocumulus that is in danger of becoming extinct because of the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. This is stratocumulus. And um, so that blew my mind. You know, the only thing I ever think of as being extinct are, you know, dinosaurs from when I was a kid in a museum. Um, and it's a mind blowing possibility, a tipping point for the environment. And it's become an important aspect of this new body of work. Um, okay, so now I'm going to introduce Stephanie, who somehow got blocked out of our session. She, she can't make it. Okay, she can't, she can't she do it. That they... Uh, she thinks that Smithsonian changed something and has blocked access. Okay, so do we want to show her images and I'll just her little introduction? Yeah, let me just jump back in and just answer. Okay. Um, so Stephanie will not be with us, so we're going to be guiding ourselves, but that's good because we're so good at that. Um, Stephanie, do, do we have, give access to her slides? Okay, great. So Stephanie is the... Um, She's the director of the largest museum in the Smithsonian family. Um, and the Smithsonian is fully engaged with a climate action plan um, and that she and they believe that artists change the way we see the world. And that is why we will be significant leaders in and participants in the march towards, uh, towards a sustainable future. Um, so we, we have their support on that. Okay, so now we, we as a group came up with a few questions to motivate our conversation. Um, so we'll start with the first one, which is, what is your unique talent as an artist or a maker in addressing climate change? And we'll just stay in our same order, going in alphabetical order. So that starts with you, Edwin. No, Nick. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Edwin, you go first. <laughs> now we're going to do ourselves. <laughs> you're muted. Edwin, you're on mute, Edwin. So you said some great things, but we can. Okay, so I was just saying that I don't know what my unique talent might be, but I think what I do as an architect um, that is maybe a little bit different um, is that we are makers of physical spaces and physical environment that surround you, so to speak. And, and so what we do um, could potentially, it's experiential and it's actually can set an example uh, for this kind of culture change and the change of value that we're discussing. Um, and then like what I was saying, like some of these projects that I just showed you earlier, um, I mean, they're not really uh, designed as I would say, uh, sustain as sort of like sustainability projects per se, but they played a role or a catalytic role in terms of how to instigate uh, to focus on some of these um, changes, like the museum became um, a, um, a catalyst to change the river, to clean up the regeneration of the area. Or um, we could serve a role to show the world how you can actually, a uh, sustainable tower, uh, you can actually be much more connected with nature. So I think some of these, uh, so I, I think that's what I do that could be potentially very different is to open uh, a precedent, to set a precedence for um, the general public and for community to think about the world differently. Okay, great. Nick, do you have anything you wanted to add as an educator? Oh, it's a wonderful question to be asked what's unique and the humility in many of us will struggle with answering that question. I think, I think my um, my joy in my work has been um, 
the opportunity to open students' eyes and now increasingly more and more uh, business executives' eyes to what climate change, what sustainability, what this whole agenda is about. And the way, the thing that I find that penetrates so often is um, asking people where the environment is and they look at me confused and then they go, oh, it's everywhere. And that then allows us to start a conversation where we go, can we stop dealing in separate understandings where there's nature over here and humans over here? And then also it allows us to go into a space where the questions we always ask is what kind of world would you like to live in? How would you like your children to live? And that trips up everybody because nobody wants a less fair, more polluted world for their children. And it's a way, I think, of collapsing psychological distance and bringing home the requirement and the challenge and the need to act. Um, and I think that's probably been the thing. I think that that vein of thinking has been the one thing that I've probably hit upon that I enjoy and probably not unique, but feels unique to me. Thank you for. Can I can I say something? Sure. Well, I, I love what Nick was talking about in the sense that I think the first step to instigating this culture change is by encouraging the younger generation to ask questions hmm. because a lot of people like kids, they just take certain things for granted. We all do that. We assume that we're living in this culture of waste and a culture of ex exuberance. And by simply asking the question, you start to rethink how we all, all want to live and, and how we could change our value to make a more sustainable future. I'll stop right here. We'll talk about it more. I'm sure later. Okay. Um, Gilbert, as somebody yeah. who goes around and makes the magic happen inside of companies, and what what what's your what's your unique talent that makes you able to do that? I, I think um, so. I, I, the thing, so I'm going to speak in, um, as a maker, like UAP is a maker, and working with public art, and I think it's really about how we can really amplify the wide range of potential benefits from fueling creativity and beautifying our cities. I think we know that public art has done that. Um, it has improved quality of life. It adds value to communities and their assets. Its accessibility actually connects a broad audience and creates strong um, mm -hmm. impacts on cities and places and people's lives. So I think for us as makers is giving what we like to do more and more now is giving voice to artists who have a strong creative voice, not only when it comes to aesthetics, but also on sustainability. So I think that's, for us, it's about um, giving voice to these artists and, and it's something that we want to really um, do more and more and collaboration is key for us. So I think that, um, and we can talk about it more later. Okay, cool. Mademoiselle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you assume. Um. <laughs> Um, so I think that I, I might go back to something that we were chatting about before our session started and um, mention that Joseph Boy's um, sort of his ethos I was thinking about how artists have this unique role um, where we're supposed to dehabituate people and um, knock us out of our kind of like enculturated um, rote beliefs where we're sort of proceeding without thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that like really that's what um, art can do that's so unique is to take us out of what, what we think the frame set is and take us a big step back and look at it. You know, like when we've been talking about how the very simple idea of like this image of the um, the blue marble, you know, the first image of Earth from space, how yes. that really drove home yeah. to people that we live on a closed system and therefore yes. this kind of central premise of um, extractive capitalism that we can have infinite growth becomes the, like the visuality of that is what really led us to understand that that's a completely flawed proposal. And so I think that, you know, artists are very good at making invisible things visible and making intangible things tangible. Um, mm -hmm. And that is really what we need in this moment is to like a really good shake. You know, the, what a lot of what we're doing is really is really crazy. Um, and it's not serving life to kind of be taking life energy and turning it into fungible, accumulatable capital. Um, it has a pretty clear end. And so the question is, like, are we going to uh, be able to change our culture? Fast enough. Yeah. 
definitely. Yeah, I think that what's uh, what's great about our group is that as artists and architects and creative people, what makes us as a group different than policymakers is exactly what you said: is that we make the intangible tangible. We can give shape and form and images and experience to some. Ideas that could be just very abstract. When you talk to a lot of Americans, they say sustainability. They don't really understand what that means. And through our work, we can actually communicate that with something that is very concrete. Yes. Something I'd just love to jump in and add is, you know, I asked this very question when I started working with the climatologists. I said, you know, why on earth would you devote time on your supercomputer to run this giant simulation so that I could make this realistic cloud? And they said, you know, they were really enthusiastic about it because it allowed them to get to a different audience than is available to them in their white papers and in their, you know, science to science magazines, you know, and it's, um, I think the real privilege of the visual artist that we work at, and creatives, that we work in a visual language that people meet outside of the realm of politics and business and yeah. in museums where their minds might be more open to a shift in thinking or a new idea. Um, and so I think that's really exciting. Okay, now we'll go to our next question. What specific strategies are you creating as an artist or maker or educator to address climate change? So something specific that you're doing. Nick? <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I was... Um... Yeah, my answer to this, something specific I'm doing right now, I guess, is probably like everybody, um, shifting my transportation patterns, I think, um, in terms of flying and so that. But the thing, the thing I'm proud of, I think, which is the drop in the ocean that creates the ripple is um, from, a, from, I think, 2012, 2013, we had made our MBA at Griffith University carbon neutral. Oh. And we were the first in the Southern Hemisphere to do it. And we think we were the first in the world to do it, but we just couldn't verify it. But we could verify we were the first in the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm really proud of that because it's like, it's like all those things. Uh, it makes me think, actually, of Jenny talking about the piano playing the music on the elephants. Those those ideas, those things we go, well, why have these guys done that? Why why have we done that? That creates ripples, I think, and that creates change. So I'm really proud of that. Thank you for asking, Karen. Um Edwin. Well, I, I think um from my perspective, you know, I think sometimes when you talk about climate change sustainability is a very kind of lofty ideas for a lot of people that they don't really understand. And from, from my perspective, I think to like, I, I would like, I like to use the, the metaphor of sort of climbing Mount Everest. So you don't run up to the top of the mountain because then you most certainly would die if you do that. So it's really about um, little, little steps that adds up to the big steps. Um, um, so I think for me as an architect, we design things Sure, you can set a carbon neutral goal for some things, that, which is also something we do, but we could start by introducing very mi micro steps, such as if we can design an interior um, that would encourage people to open the window more often, mm -hmm. as opposed to turning on the air conditioner. Mm -hmm. um, because we, by doing that, you could people could realize that fresh air and sunlight and all these things that sometimes we take for granted is actually good for you and good for the planet. And if we could design master plans that makes it very pleasant to walk and um, ride a bicycle as opposed to what Americans like to do, which is to drive down the street to, to go to buy grocery, I don't know. <laughs> So to encourage that kind of thing, it's something very simple, it seems to me, but people don't do that. Yeah, it's powerful. Uh, yeah, and, and also one of my big thing is the culture of waste and how much we waste everything. 
so the construction industry um, is responsible for almost like 40% of waste. It's incredible because in America, people think you can afford to waste all this stuff from food to materials to all that stuff. So like my project, the little, the project of, of the interior, I like to think that you can create beautiful interior by repurposing a forest. Yeah. Or if you can design uh, a housing development around existing trees and ecology. So very simple things. It's not you know, rocket science. Yeah. But that could make a big difference in terms of how we all live and how we all work and how we can make a better planet for the future. Okay, great. Gilbert. Yes, that's, that's amazing. That's a lot of, there's a lot of, of, of inspiring answers. And I think for us as for UAP, again, um, I think it, our, our, our sustainability strategy, we, we were lucky to be working with Professor Nick Barter and Griffith University um, because we actually be, we realized that UAP is now one of the largest and can be influential art foundry in, in, in the world. So I think for us, three years ago, we didn't have um, a strategy yet. And then we created this initiative called One Earth. And our One Earth, is the aim for that is to really become future normal. So Nick Barter coined that term. And then for us, future normal means it's an organization that is fit for the 21st century acts me meaningfully in its surroundings, aim for 100% well-being, and sees money as a means at an end. It, it actually started with just uh, unlearning things. I think it's very important. I think when the world is of sustainability, you need to unlearn things. And that started with the training from, from everyone in uh, uh, Australia, and now we're cascading it in the U.S. and China. I remember during the training and looking, at, looking back at the, the journey of the team, we actually started with just removing our desk bins in, in our in our um, uh, office and that and replacing it with a centralized um, segregation trash bins. We were able to start with small steps. That's why when when Edwin said micro wins, that's very important sustainability. Micro wins. We started with the desk bins, then we started with so, and then we goes to solar energy, and then we are doing carbon audit, and then now we are doing our the artwork ingredient list wherein we're trying to calculate all of the carbon emissions of the prod of the artworks that we produce. And I think that's where we really want, because what we want to create in the future is not UAP changing, but the whole of the art foundry business and manufacturing and bespoke manufacturing to change. So, yeah, yeah, that would, that's so fabulous. Jenny, specific mm -hmm. strategies that you've engaged with that you find are working. Well, I think one thing I have to do, and I emailed Gilbert about this, is that um, artists commit and UAP should be talking because we're working mostly with museums and galleries to try to get them to track their carbon and decarbonize. But we're also super interested in fabrication, shipping, art fairs. That's where a lot of the carbon emissions in the art world come from. So, um, you know, we know that we all need to be talking with each other and sharing strategies. Um, and then in my own work, I think I really work in two different ways. One is sort of about the present. One is about the future. Now, I think that it's really important, um, and I do this in a lot of my projects, is to think about how to bear witness to the current moment and also how to mourn. Um, you know, we don't really, we've never as a society had a way to mourn the loss of an entire species, to mourn the loss of biospheres, of ways of life, of you know, languages, um, entire like umwelts or ways of being that are disappearing from the planet. And I think that it's important to mark that not in a way that's fatalistic, but in a way where we sort of understand the gravity of the choices of, that we're making. Um, and then secondarily, I think that I'm really interested in thinking about how as art, our, as artists and through artworks, we can propose how things might be otherwise in ways that are really like, you know, potentially really radical and really form shifting so that we can decenter the human from the way that we are conceptualizing how we might live in the future and think about reconnecting ourselves back with the natural world. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, it was, um, I'll just add my little addition, which is definitely related to carbon. When I was working with the climatologist and I learned about that cloud, one day I was sitting in my studio, you know, working away, tearing a glassine window out of a paper envelope so I could recycle everything. And I looked across, and I saw all the materials in my studio and I was like, oh boy, you know, I just saw the carbon footprint, like for the, you know, 
I had been aware of it, but I saw it and it was like, and I just couldn't not do anything about it. So um, I did a massive audit of my entire studio practice from 1990 forward. Um, and I worked with a, uh, a, a scientist who was a carbon auditor and, you know, we took the big, the outside big numbers on everything, you know, the iron, the glass, the stone, the shipping, the crating, the molds, you know, everything, all the energy that came into the studio, everything I could find. Um, and then I doubled that number because, you know, I thought if I'm going to do this, I want to do it absolutely for real. You know, I don't want to just, you know, I, I, I adopted this idea of do no harm. And I was like, well, why don't I actually do some good? And, uh, and then I worked with, uh, I learned quite a bit, you know, there's a lot of discussion about carbon offsets. Are they effective? Are they not effective? And I found an organization, um, Cool Effect, that um, has scientifically verified and then monitored moving forward offsets. And, uh, you know, I worked with them. And what I really liked about their projects were that they were socially beneficial as well as ecologically beneficial. So it was sort of two mindsets coming together. Um, and then now in the studio, I'm trying to go one step further, which is take things that are waste or problematic, like carbon. Right now in the studio, I'm working with um, captured carbon um, and seeing what I can do with that. Um, so I like to call that the greenest black. All right, so now we'll move on to our next question. Well, let me look at our time. So we have about 13 minutes. Should we just go through and let everybody have their sort of capstone moment? Um, or here we go. This We'll go with our last question because that was a great one. How do we need to think differently, act differently to create a more beautiful and sustainable future? What can we do? Nick, now we have to be quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Think differently, act differently. A um, couple of things I want to say. It, it, it's about the questions you ask. It's about the conversations you start that really creates change. And so I would encourage people to ask questions about where does this come from? How did it get here? Where is it going? What was involved? Um, if I was to leave people with something that that I find tends to give everybody a physical look is Remember, you're the earth walking around. You know, the earth, uh, like apple trees, apple, the earth produces people and we're the earth walking around and just start to think about that and what it means to live, you know, a fulfilled, beautiful life. And I think that's a way into a lack of separation and then a start uh, to understand that you are, you are at home, you always have been at home and what do you want your home to be like? Thank you. Edwin? Well, um, in a way, I've sort of touched on some of this in my earlier comments, but I, I would say if I have to just summarize it in a sort of executive summary way, I think we as a, a human species need to kind of put our egos aside meaning that we need to recognize that we're not quote unquote master of the earth. We're only a guest and we are living or cohabiting the earth with other species and with nature. And we need to, it would be a smart thing for us as a guest to live in harmony with nature and with the other species. So we're just one of many different of a bigger ecosystem. Um, and I think once you recognize that, you realize that a lot of the things that we do that we take for granted somehow is heading in the other direction. Um, and we need to recap, then you obviously will need to recalibrate and be our behavior and our value system, going back to the title of our topic, in order for us to be able to have a beautiful, sustainable future. Fabulous. Um, Gilbert. Yeah, I'll do like a very different way of answering that question. I think I always ask the question, what would Copernicus do in the 21st century? If, if I am, uh, I think, and, and I think um, Edwin mentioned about micro victory. So I think for me, 
what's going to be important for us is acknowledging and remembering that small wins a little yes. in our lifetime is critical so we need to celebrate them and we need to stop overlooking them because if we start rejoicing the world with those baby steps it will drive us forward to a future normal world i think all of those small steps will add up to the big victory so i think for me the way it's really about those small victories and small wins well to if i may interject like to elaborate on on what what gilbert's talking about you know in swahili which is the african native language they have this thing called poli poli which is a step at a time if you want mm -hmm. to get up to the mountain in swahili it's poli poli and that's the small win it's only a, an accumulation of this that you would get to the big on the two top mm -hmm. awesome all right jenny yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think that that makes me think of um, Joanna Macy's concept of active hope. And so, you know, how instead of having this passive hope where we're, which is what, you know, most humans have been doing, even humans involved in the environmental movement for the last several decades, as we've been hoping someone else is going to fix the problem if we can stay hopeful. Um, but, you know, really, we have to um, be part of that ourselves. And I think it's it's wise to continue to celebrate those small victories, especially as things seem increasingly difficult and fragile in our world. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it's really important, um, you know, as culture creators to uh, think about how we can really centrally reframe these issues um, and move from a scarcity mindset, which of course is very convenient for extractive capitalism to have us thinking that, you know, everything is scarce and we need to be in competition with one another for resources to a mentality of abundance. And that mm -hmm. when we can remember that we live in a world that is abundant, that is verdant, that is also unique in our solar system, um, Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos and Elon Musk, who are trying to get to Mars, might want to concentrate on this planet for a little yes. while. Um, you know, that we really need to be in a relationship of reciprocity with our planet and really remembering that these, again, that these are that these are gifts. This is not something where we can extract from one place and move it elsewhere because there's no elsewhere. We right. We have one world. That's the truth. I have, um, and things, well, for, um, things for moderating for us. Oh, my pleasure. I don't know. If, you know, you guys are so reasonable. Um, and someday we are going to get together in real life. But from um, Stephanie, it seems like because of what's happening in the Ukraine, the government increased their cybersecurity. And that's what prevented her from getting on this time. So she sends her apologies. And um, and I am actually going to quote Edwin. Um, oh, Edwin no, quoting, the for that Swahili thing? No, no, from a different article that I read about you, which is when the winds of change blow, it's from a proverb, when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and other people build windmills. Um, and what I really think is important is so many people have fear about addressing climate change. They think everything that they love is going to be. And I think what we as creative individuals making art and making living spaces, public and private, um, that we have a way of showing that there's there will be no loss. We can make windmills out of this, you know, that it can be a great leap forward in aesthetics and enjoyment. And if we are looking at resources that are universally available, the sun shines on all parts of the earth, the wind blows on all parts of the earth. I think it will make um, all of the opportunities much more equal for everybody who lives here, which would be a really exciting thing. That That's an ancient uh, Chinese wisdom. Yeah. Thing. So yeah, I, I like to look at ancient, like it, because th I think those people, they have inhabited the earth for thousands of years. And usually that's a word of wisdom that we should still remember and be reminded of. Yes, it's fabulous. I read that quote and I was like, that is how I am living my life from now on. I am just building windmills. Um, so we have five brief minutes left. Does anybody have anything that's sort of percolated in the last few minutes that they want to add before we sign off? Do we have any questions from? Um, oh, do we? Do we? I, I don't questions. know. Does anybody? Can we see? Uh, I don't know. I thought you would. Be oh, do we have any? No, no questions. Um, you know, and the, the final thing that something we talked quite a bit about in our practice sessions is that I think because artists have this 
and creatives have almost this sort of magical ability to materialize immaterial things, um, like solutions to big problems, um, that it would be wonderful if artists were sitting at the table with scientists, politicians, and business leaders as yeah, we yeah. build a green future. I think that artists and creatives have a lot to contribute and would be a wonderful addition to those conversations where everybody is looking for solutions. Because we can potentially bring out of the box solution. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, we were talking in one of our um, conversations about this idea that like people are trying to play this really complicated game chess, um, and they're you know working you know economists and politicians, governance. We're all working to try to figure out what the next move is, and artists are like, oh, but you're not even thinking about what's off the edge of the board. And so I do think that there is an important role for people who are um, you know interested in creating generative generative futures and new ways of looking at the world to be in on some of these other conversations. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all so much. It has been a pleasure to get to know you and to have these conversations. And the only thing I regret is that we don't get to sit together in person. Um, but someday that will happen. We will all cross paths again. And I I'll come to Brock anytime. I yes. haven't been, as you know, I haven't been in a while. So it's as soon as we can do that, I'll come your way. Yeah. My house is an open house and my studio is an open studio. So feel free to stop on by anytime. This is, of course, the low carbon way of getting together. So <laughs> you, should, you should host to that. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, everybody. That Take was care. awesome. It's been Talk a pleasure. Thank yeah, you. It's really been a pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Thank Me you. Me too. Bye. Okay. Thanks.